Hi everyone, today we're going to be going over the basics of flower identification and today we're just going over the basics but in the near future I hope to release a more advanced video and this is because flowers have a lot of parts and they can range from being pretty simple to very complex. Now without further delay, I hope that you find this video educational and useful. Now let's get to learning about the basics of flower identification. To help us learn some general information, we have a Venus's looking glass flower. A flower itself is made up of modified leaves that look way different than what you might think of as a leaf. So the first thing we want to do when identifying a flower is to see what sorts of modified leaves it has. The first modified leaf type we're going to look for are sepals, which are leaf-like structures that protect a bud. Next we have the modified leaf that flowers are most known for, which are their petals. Petals are often bright colors, but they don't have to be, and they produce nice scents that also might help to attract pollinators. Our next modified leaf are the stamens, which are the male reproductive organs of the flower. Lastly, we have our pistil, otherwise known as the carpal, which are our female reproductive organ of the flower. Now, each type of modified leaf belongs to its own group or world in the flower. A whorl is all of a single type of modified leaf on a flower. For instance, if you wanted to refer to all the sepals on a flower, you would refer to it as a calyx, which is the whorl for sepals. The corolla is the whorl for the petals and is used when referring to all of the petals. Now, if you wanted to refer to both the corolla and the calyx at the same time, you could. You would just refer to all of the petals and all of the sepals on the flower as the perianth. Now the third whorl of a flower is the andresium and it contains all of the stamen, whereas the fourth whorl is the gynesium and it contains all of the pistils or carpels. Just to recap, there are four whorls in a flower, the calyx that contains all of the sepals, the corolla that contains all of the petals, the andresium that contains all of the stamen, and the gynesium that contains all of the pistils or carpels. All right, now that we've learned all about whorls, we're gonna use the bell-shaped flower of Solomon's seal to get a closer look at the reproductive organs of a flower. If we cut one of these flowers open, we'll get a clear view of those organs. Here we have a big yellow anther, which is where pollen is produced, and we have a thin white filament, which holds up the anther. Together, the anther and the filament make the stamen, the male reproductive organ. Next, we have a stigma, which is a sticky bulb where pollen will land to fertilize a flower. The stigma sits on top of the style, which is a tube that holds up the stigma and rests on top of the ovary, which contains the egg cells of the flower known as ovules. Altogether, the stigma, style, and ovary make up a pistil or carpal, which is the female reproductive organ. Now to get a closer look at what's inside of an ovary, we're going to take a look at a common daffodil. First, let's go over some new terminology that doesn't quite pertain to the reproductive structures of our flower. Those yellow modified leaves that we might think are considered petals on a daffodil can be considered tepals because there are some petals and sepals mixed in there, but they're indistinguishable. Additionally, a daffodil has a pretty notable structure in the middle of its flower called a corona, which are just tepals that fuse together. If we look at a full side profile of a daffodil, we'll see a dry brown thing that looks sort of like an onion skin. That's called a spathe, which protects the flower bud as it gets ready to bloom, then proceeds to dry out. Now that our daffodil is no longer protected, we can cut it in half and look at its ovary. Let's actually cut it in half again, but transversely this time. Here we'll see three spaces in the ovary known as locules, which occur when three carpels fuse together. Although a single carpel will have a single locule. We can see where the carpels fused by the septa, which divide the locules. Finally, the little white dots inside of each locule are the ovules, which are the egg cells of the flower. Something you all may have noticed earlier is that some species have flowers with whorls that are fused together, while others have unfused whorls. Whorls that are unfused, such as the calyx of this partridge pea flower, are known as free. Each sepal of the calyx is distinct or separated from the other, 
Whereas if we look at the flower of an oligony monkey flower, we'll see that its calyx is fused and all of its sepals are conate or connected and have formed a tube. To go to sort of an extreme of fused flowers and reproduction, let's look at a more complex species, jewelweed. Jewelweed has a flower that can be found in two different forms. The first form is the large orange cone-shaped flower. This flower is chasmogamous, meaning it opens up and cross-pollinates with other flowers. The other form of flower is a small green one, which is called cleistogamous. This flower never opens and pollinates itself. Having these small cleistogamous flowers ensures that there will be seed production even in the absence of pollinators. However, the plants that grow from the seeds of cleistogamous flowers are smaller than plants grown from the seeds of chasmogamous flowers. All right, now we're just gonna be focusing on the chasmogamous flower, which has five total fused petals around the opening. There is one on top, two on the sides, and two that form a landing pad for insect pollinators, although hummingbirds also pollinate these flowers. There are three total sepals, two of which are right behind the top petal, and the third sepal actually forms a cone shape uh, with a nectar spur at the end. The flowers of this species have both male and female reproductive parts. However, it can be a little deceiving because they won't be male functioning or female functioning at the same time. When a jewelweed's flower first emerges, it will be male and have five fused stamen. The pistil is hiding under these stamen so that the flower can't pollinate itself. Once the stamen fall off, which happens after about 24 hours, the pistil is revealed and the flower is now functioning as a female. Now moving in a bit of a different direction, you may have heard of an inflorescence, which is a cluster of flowers that comes from the same stem or peduncle. Inflorescences can be many different shapes, ranging from more spike-like to ball-shaped. You might be wondering, why is there a sunflower up there? Isn't that just one flower? Well, no, a sunflower is actually a whole bunch of small flowers. To better understand how this is possible, let's talk about ray and disc flowers. Ray flowers are sterile flowers that resemble petals and are typically on the edge of a flower head whereas disc flowers are fertile flowers and typically form a disc in the center of a flower head. Common groundsel has no ray flowers and is in full bloom, whereas butterweed has ray flowers and is also in bloom. Now, if we make our way back to our sunflower, which is more specifically an ashy sunflower, the ashy sunflower produces 15 to 30 ray flowers. At the same time, it forms many disc flowers that make up the center of the flower head. Let's go ahead and take a closer look at one of these disc flowers. Each disc flower of an ashy sunflower has five petals, five brown stamen, two fused pistils, and two sepals. Now, if we take a look at the underside of an ashy sunflower, we'll notice that it has small leaf-like structures that look like sepals. Those are the phylaries or bracts, which have a similar function to the sepals, but they're on the outside of the flower head. The phylaries of an ashy sunflower are short, curly, and pubescent. Now, if we take a look at another type of inflorescence, which belongs to a pokeberry, we'll notice that it looks quite different than that of our sunflower. Let's zoom in and see that this inflorescence has small yet noticeable flowers that are held up by a pedicel which is a stalk that supports an individual flower. Now those pedicels are attached to the peduncle, otherwise known as the main stalk of the inflorescence. Alrighty, we're gonna switch gears again, but this time we're going to be talking about pollinator flower interactions. Let's start out with hummingbirds, which are known to target more tubular flowers, such as columbines and wild bergamot, that might be bright colors, especially red, orange, or pink. That's why hummingbird feeders are mostly red with a bit of yellow, because red is a hummingbird's favorite color. As for butterflies, they prefer flowers that are more pink, purple, yellow, red, or orange in color. Similarly, bees prefer purples, blues, white, and yellows. They can't see red at all, but they love the color purple. Now, when it comes to plants like wild ginger and jack in the pulpit that are pollinated by gnats and flies, they rely mostly on odor, but they will still use color to a degree. 
For instance, the flower of wild ginger smells like rotting flesh and is red to mimic a dead animal as to attract gnats and flies. There are some more very important pollinators such as wasps, beetles, and moths, but we're not going to touch on them in this video. Just know that they're helping out as well. Also, while a species of flower may be predominantly pollinated by one type of pollinator, many other types of pollinators may also pollinate that species, just to a lesser extent. Okay, here we have a photo of rose pink, which is your typical insect pollinated flower. Rose pink is known as something called a perfect flower, which means that it has both male and female reproductive organs. We can see those yellow stamens full of pollen and that long pistil. Now in contrast, we have the wind pollinated flowers from a red maple tree. You may notice that these wind pollinated flowers aren't all that showy and that's because they don't need to waste the energy making beautiful petals to attract insects when the wind is just going to disperse their pollen. Now these red maple flowers are known as imperfect flowers, which means that the male or female reproductive parts are found on different flowers. We can see those stamen on the male flowers and the bright red pistils on the female flowers. Now when a flower is perfect or both male and female flowers are found on the same plant, that plant is called a monaceous plant. Whereas if the male and female flowers are on different plants, the plant is dioecious. Red maple is known to be mostly dioecious, having male and female flowers on separate trees, but there are some instances where it can have both flowers on the same tree and be monaceous. Next, we're gonna talk about completeness. For a flower to be complete, it has to have petals, sepals, pistils, and stamen. If we look at our rose pink flower, we know that it has pistils and stamen because it is a perfect flower. It also has beautiful pink petals. Lastly, we can't see the sepals on this flower, but if we look next to it at a flower that is about to bloom, we can see that it definitely has sepals. Therefore, our rose pink flower is a complete one because it has members from all four worlds. As for our red maple, they do have petals and sepals, but they're just very small and difficult to see. Plus, you don't need to go that deep to tell that these flowers are incomplete. We know that one flower has stamen while the other flower has pistils. Therefore, each flower only has three out of the four required whorls and is incomplete. All right, here is the flower of spring beauty to sort of test your knowledge and recap what we've learned in this video. Would you say this flower is perfect? Well, it has a pistil and a stamen. It has both male and female reproductive organs, so yes, it is perfect. Would you say this flower is monaceous or dioecious? Well, this flower is perfect. Both male and female parts are found on this plant, so it is monaceous. Now, would you say that this flower is complete or incomplete? We know that this flower has two of our four worlds already checked off the Andresium and the Gynesium, due to the presence of our pistil and stamen. But what about our calyx and our corolla? We can see some sepals on the back of the flower over here. So that means that we have our calyx whorl checked off, three down, one to go. Our last whorl is staring right at us in the face with those beautiful pinkish white petals. So that checks off our corolla and gives this flower four out of four whorls, meaning that it is a complete flower. Alrighty, thank you all for watching. I hope that you enjoyed learning about the basics of flower identification with me. If you did, be sure to like and subscribe, and I hope to see you all in my next video.